Playing Luigi's Mansion 3 was quite the roller coaster ride. Except, it wasn't a suspenseful rise and an exciting drop. Instead, imagine if you laboriously climbed up the track, but right before the exciting drop, the coaster stops, your safety harness comes off, the door opens, and that's the ride. You then take the stairs to go back down, and an employee finds you and forces you to ride the roller coaster again. Continue this for about 15 or so times, and that's how it felt to play the game. If I had to describe my experience in the form of a food order, it would be a big helping of desperation, a side order of fatigue, and for dessert, a very conservative portion of fun. In this video, I'll be going very in-depth with my feelings on the game. With that in mind, I've split this video up into three major parts. Good, bad, and please make it stop. I'll give a quick rundown of the story before the three-part structure begins, just in case anyone hasn't played the game, and afterwards I'll discuss the multiplayer. I'll give a brief spoiler, the multiplayer was surprisingly my favorite part of the entire game. There are links in the description if you don't want to watch this video all at once. I will be comparing this title to the first Luigi's Mansion throughout, so if you haven't watched my video on the first game, maybe it would be a good idea to watch that one first to get some context. Before we begin with the story, I need to go over how this game came about and the expectations of its fanbase. Luigi's Mansion 3 launched 18 years after the series' last entry on a main console. The series had a sequel on the 3DS in between, which I haven't spent a lot of time with. Unlike the original game, which nobody asked for, Luigi's Mansion 3 was a highly sought-after title, selling twice as many copies in its first few months after launch. It wasn't heavily speculated Nintendo was working on a new Luigi's Mansion game, but when the trailer came out for the Belmonts to be included in the new Super Smash Bros. game, fans of the series were united in thinking it was a hint that they were working on the next Luigi's Mansion. I'm not sure if Nintendo intended for the trailer to give off that impression, but one year later we got Luigi's Mansion 3 on the Switch. What's important to note about this is that Luigi's Mansion 1 had no expectations, thus could do whatever the heck it wanted and players wouldn't have anything to compare it to. Luigi's Mansion 3, however, now has two games fans of the series will compare it to. The 3DS sequel took the series in a very different direction, and for the most part changed the formula up entirely. A likely reason for this is the first title was made in-house by Nintendo, while the sequel was made by Next Level Games, a second-party studio that mostly only develops Nintendo games. Luigi's Mansion 3 was also made by Next Level Games. So whether you like the original or the sequel more might be an indication on whether the third entry can win you over. The story of the game stays much more in the background this time around, or maybe it only felt that way as I don't really have anything negative to say about it. It starts off with Luigi and his pals on a bus, on their way to a hotel for a vacation. When you arrive, you get to walk around the entry hall area where you can interact with objects and talk to the hotel staff. Eventually, the owner of the hotel makes an appearance and thanks Luigi for accepting her invitation. They're apparently VIPs of the hotel and are shown to their rooms. Mario and Luigi say night-night to each other even though the sunlight is baking every inch of the hotel. Night -night. Night -night. Luigi decides to get some sleep and is awoken by a violent scream in the middle of the night. Mario, the Toads, and Peach aren't in their rooms. Going down the hall, he meets the owner again. This time, she's a ghost. She reveals that she invited him and his friends to the hotel to trap them in paintings, as her newly freed partner, King Boo, wanted to get back at him. You run away as he tries to frame you, escaping via laundry chute. Following his ghost doggo, Luigi finds a new poltergust and eventually finds his old pal Egad in a painting. You rescue him after you find the dark light power-up, you escort him to the basement, and on the way, Egad encourages Luigi to collect as much money as he possibly can, because greed, of course. Apparently Toad and the rest are trapped on higher floors. The only way to reach them is the elevator, which you find two of the missing elevator buttons after the first boss fight. Egad has a mobile lab he brought with him to the hotel, which he will now operate and stay in for the remainder of the game. He reveals to Luigi that he was also tricked into coming to this hotel, except his bait was an interesting ghost collection. Instead, he was captured and his ghost collection stolen, including King Boo. So now Luigi has three basic goals. Catch the ghost for Egad, get more elevator buttons to reach higher floors, and rescue his friends. Luigi then uses the elevator to proceed to the next floor available to him. You then go through the hotel floor by floor, defeating a new boss on each one, which grants a new elevator button. Place the button into its slot, go to a new floor, and begin the process all over again. At some point, a purple cat steals your elevator button, and you need to chase it to get it again. After you get the button back, it's business as usual. 
You find two toads locked in their paintings on floors 4 and 9. Once you get to floor 12, Egad calls you back as one of the toads you rescued has gone missing. He was sent to find another gadget for Egad, Luigi has to go find him, you do a short escort mission bringing him back, and Egad gives you the super suction power. You find and rescue another toad on floor 12, the cat steals a button from you again after the fitness center area, you eventually find the hotel owner, Helen Gravely, once more on the top floor. You defeat her in a boss fight, and afterwards you rescue Mario. You both go to the roof of the hotel and find King Boo. He says enough is enough, and uses some magic to bring Egad and all three of the toads he rescued up and into a painting, then tries to trap Luigi and Mario in the painting as well. Luigi dodges, King Boo has a hard time counting to seven, and you fight him as the final boss of the game. After you defeat him, you rescue all of your pals. The gem from King Boo's head breaks, and the ghosts of the hotel seem to come out of a trance. They aren't bad guys anymore, and in the credits you can see them help building Luigi's new, new, new mansion. Okay, let's get to the good parts of the game. While you already no doubt have the impression that I disliked many aspects of the game, there still are quite a few things I did like. What immediately caught my eye when playing was how stunning the game is. Luigi's Mansion 1 did about as much as it could given that it was a launch title for hardware that is now nearly 20 years old. Games eventually were able to look pretty decent on the GameCube, but even at its best, it doesn't come close to how good Luigi's Mansion 3 looks. I'm not very good at putting into words my thoughts on artistic and graphical qualities, so I'll spare you my attempt, I just think the game is very easy to look at and surprisingly detailed. Along with how good it looks, nearly every object you see can be interacted with. I couldn't believe my eyes the first hour or so of gameplay. Everything Luigi runs over moves around or can be sucked up into the vacuum. Trash along the floor gets kicked back and forth when just walking through the area normally. In the first game, you could suck up bed sheets and curtains and such, but you can suck up everything in this game. It's insane. I'm not claiming it's a meaningful addition, as it doesn't add depth to the gameplay in any way, shape, or form, but it's something that I appreciated throughout the entire adventure. There are a few gameplay changes and additions I liked when coming from the first title to this game. The plunger is a neat concept, the thought of shooting a plunger out of your vacuum alone has me sold already, but being able to use your vacuum along with it to pull open or smash something isn't something I expected when first playing the game. There's something to be said about a plunger finally being used in a video game featuring Mario and Luigi. I'm not going to pretend I know for certain plungers haven't appeared before, but being in line with the supposed job description of the Mario Brothers is a good touch. It also goes along with the theme of cleaning tools being weaponized. The vacuum and now a plunger. Maybe Luigi's Mansion 4 will even include a mop. Another great gameplay feature is Gooigi, a green gelatinous clone of Luigi. When Gooigi is out, you switch your conscience back and forth to control either him or Luigi. The last action you are performing when you switch will keep going, so you can utilize both at the same time with vacuum puzzles, combat sections, and best of all, double plunger pulls on a big watermelon. He has a weakness to water, and his health is very low, so there's some strategy needed when solving puzzles with him. The combat got a revamp from the original, as you don't have to keep suctioning the ghost the entire time, you can slam them on the ground for 20 damage each hit. You can usually get 4 hits in, meaning it's generally a smart strategy to vacuum them down to 80 or less health before you start swinging them around. You can also hit other enemies with the ghost you're slamming, which can break their guards without needing to do whatever specific puzzle the game would have had you do otherwise. At first, I didn't like the addition of the slam maneuver, as it felt too action-y, but I've come to like it over time. I think if a fourth installment is made, they should be careful not to double down on this type of thing. Luigi's Mansion wasn't great because of its action combat. There were a few floors of the hotel I enjoyed going through quite a bit. The Boiler Works area has you using a floaty traveling down a sewer river. You use Gooigi frequently to open gates, and since water is his weakness anyway, it creates some nice puzzles. I mostly just wanted to mention this section because I like how the water looks. Even though there's trash floating everywhere, it manages to look very pretty. The tomb area that starts with the open sand excavation area is great. The puzzles that utilize the sand were a welcome change of pace, like using your blower on the vacuum to push sand to create a hill tall enough to reach certain platforms. The mummies are a nice touch, they are only found in this area and it helps give the floor some unique flavor. The Twisted Sweets floor was also a treat. There are basically no ghosts on the first go around, everything is linear and normal. Eventually you find the three magician top hat bosses, but they keep running away. Once you find them in the last room of the floor, 
you then have to go through the entire floor again, but now every room has a ghost combat section, and every time you enter a door, the room positions change. Being able to explore every room in safety, then going through it all again with the twist of the maze and the combat sections creates a nice two-half structure that elevates an otherwise linear area. There's also a spot where you can use your vacuum on the saw back and forth to cut a box, a classic magic trick, plus the shower is chained up like another popular magic escape act. I love how well this all fits with the theme of the floor. The Paranormal Productions floor, which is themed like a TV studio, has its own unique gameplay challenge. There are four rooms that are connected to the main hub via TVs. It's basically a set for a movie production, each room has a different scene, Luigi can interact with the camera, and you use Gooigi to solve whatever puzzle that scene has you do. Seeing the blue screen normally, but looking through the camera and seeing all of the special effects is a really cool idea. The most interesting part is you need to figure out what item or puzzle piece you need from each scene to eventually get the director's megaphone back to him. You bring the bucket to the well, the witch comes up and fills it with water. You bring the water bucket to the castle siege area to grow a plant that you need to climb to acquire a torch. You bring the torch to the scene with the flaming buildings to get fire on the torch. And finally, bring that torch with the fire on it to the spider web area to burn the web. Afterwards, the boss fight is a nice spectacle where you fight Godzilla. I wouldn't say the boss fight is anything to write home about, but it's a fun gimmick. I also appreciate that you don't need to capture the director ghost. I didn't want to capture him since he never showed me any harm, and was happy I could just leave when I got the button. There are a few bosses of the game I want to praise. For the most part, they're all fairly decent, but there are three that are above the rest, and one of them has plenty of redeeming qualities. Clem and the Boiler Works is a boss fight where you need to ride a ducky floaty, using your vacuum to guide your makeshift boat around the pool of water in this sewer-like area. Once he's fatigued, you vacuum him and shoot him into the spikes to pop his floaty. When your floaty gets popped, Luigi has to take time to blow it back up. <laughs> Fantastic. Another great boss fight, top to bottom, is the Magician Trio on floor 11. They first shoot cards at you, they eventually dive into their top hats, circle Luigi, and finally attack, which you counter with a ground pound attack. What's great about this fight is once you capture one of them, they are replaced with a bomb in their top hat, so now you need to watch which hat to attack at the end of the sequence. On the third go around, two of the hats house bombs, and only one is the ghost. You get a fancy arena to fight in, and the fight doesn't overstay its welcome. On the spectral catch floor, you fight a literal shark. He eventually takes the form of the ship itself, so in a way you get to battle the arena you're standing in. You need to vacuum up bombs and shoot them into his mouth. Once he's out, wait for him to whiff enough and take 100 health from him. In the last phase, he turns the boat on its side, attempting to swallow you whole. You need to use the plunger to hit a target and vacuum it so Luigi can hang on without taking damage. Again, you get an interesting arena to fight in, and the fight itself is, for the most part, a fun time. The last boss fight I want to discuss is the Pharaoh Lady in the sand area. There are a few things I like about this fight. I love the sand vacuuming mechanic in general, I love the gradual change in appearance her sand face has throughout the fight, and the arena you're in was the first room you entered on the floor. Recontextualizing something you've seen or used previously, whether it be an item, gameplay mechanic, or in this case just a room, helps the game feel more dynamic. Before it was a near empty explorable fossil excavation site for Luigi and his vacuum, and now it's the stage for a grand boss fight. I have a lot of bad things to say about this fight, but that will of course be later on. The game has quite a few smaller details that I really appreciated. When on floor 4, with the musical theme, you encounter a few instruments in which you can use your vacuum to blow in and... When you escort Toad back to Egad, you can shoot him out of your vacuum. It's needed to hit a few things like a ladder or a wall, but you can also shoot him just for fun. He seems to enjoy it, so it's not abuse or anything, right? Maybe it's abuse a little bit. It's okay, he got me back right after by shoving me out of the way when I was trying to capture a ghost. Quite possibly my favorite thing about the main game was the initial sequence in the entry hall of the hotel. Walking around, interacting with your Mario pals, seeing your ghost doggo be funny, and enjoying the visuals at your own pace. If you're observant, you will notice the hotel staff are all wearing masks. I'm kind of shocked at how subtle and easily missable this is, as usually Nintendo is pretty heavy-handed. 
I guess it really doesn't go anywhere, as about 15 minutes later you'll see the ghosts and will never think about the masks or the ghosts in disguise ever again. When you go to your hotel room, one of the most adorable things happens. Petting your ghost doggo, I, I don't have anything else to add, just listen to it. Puppy. <laughs> oh, Puga Pub. It seems a lot of effort was put in to make this game funny. It didn't always land for me, but there were a few times I enjoyed it quite a bit. When on floor 3, once you use Guiji to take the key, a ghost tries to scare him thinking it's the real Luigi. Guiji, of course, just stands there. Another similar moment happens when the floor 8 elevator button lands on his head. When you're in the boiler works, you need to use the ducky floaty to move around the water. Every single time Luigi hops on, he makes the same yippy noise, and every single time I love it. When you're on the Paranormal Productions floor, when the director is sobbing, he actively avoids Luigi's eyesight by turning his head a different way. Alright, that's everything about the main game I enjoyed. Yeah, there's still a lot of time left in this video. Even though I was able to extract a few minutes worth of things I liked, the vast majority of my feelings on Luigi's Mansion 3 aren't positive. I'll start this section with a small discussion on some of the combat and gameplay changes that were made. I think giving Luigi more and more tools to work with actually backfired in a way. I said I like the plunger, but it too has a hand in this. When figuring out puzzles or finding secrets, you now have the vacuum suction, vacuum blower, flashlight, dark light, ground pound, plunger, and Guiji to fiddle with at every opportunity. This means if you really are trying to find everything in the game, be prepared to test every circular or flat looking thing with the plunger, every item connected to the ground with the ground pound, every suspicious looking thing with the flashlight, every object in the game with your vacuum, and literally every inch of the wall, floor, and objects with the dark light. I think this issue bleeds into other areas of the game, but I'll get to those later. There is a pretty big issue in regards to the aiming when it comes to the plunger shot or any projectile you shoot out of your vacuum. The game has a pretty strong auto-aim when you point your vacuum close enough to a viable target, with the plunger, a flat surface, or a circular shape might trigger it. I think the inclusion of auto-aim is okay, but when you're not locked on, it's very difficult to know where you're aiming. This ties in with how poorly the camera works as well. It technically works the same way it does in the first game, but Luigi's Mansion 3 features much larger rooms. Even in the first game, the boss arena suffered from it, especially the final fight with Mechanical Bowser. In that fight, the camera made it difficult to know where you were on the Z-axis. This time around, that can still be an issue, but not a very serious one. It mostly propped up when Gooigi and Luigi were present and on opposite sides of the room. The main problem I ran into was in boss fights when attempting to quickly aim your plunger or projectile at the target. Oftentimes, I had no clue where my very tiny blue cursor was. The shark fight had this happen with the plunger, trying to hit the literal target to avoid taking damage when he tipped the ship. The final fight with King Boo was also annoying for this, as you needed to shoot bombs into his mouth. He creates copies of himself, only one is the correct one to shoot bombs at. Sometimes the boos attack so quickly you had barely any time to aim, and you are so far away from the action, trying to find that tiny blue dot didn't seem feasible. On the topic of the items, one power-up in particular seemed completely wasted. The super suction. The only time it's needed to gain progress is in the spectral catch. Beyond that, there are two optional areas in the musical stage area and the dance floor area. Both just give you a single hidden gem. I love how powerful it is and how good it feels to use, but not getting a chance to use it more often makes it seem like a pointless inclusion. I think the final fight with a giant boo in particular seems like a perfect fit for the power-up, and I was completely shocked when I didn't get to use it. While I have a lot of problems with this game, a minor change to the title, something seemingly insignificant, could have made a big difference for me. As strange as it may sound, the first mistake Nintendo made with the game, in my opinion, was calling it Luigi's Mansion. Luigi's Mansion 3 doesn't take place in a mansion, it takes place in a hotel. Maybe they didn't want to reference Hotel Mario, but I think naming it Luigi's Hotel would have been a good way to signify to fans of the original that things will be different this time around. 
No matter how you feel about the changes next level games made with the gameplay and theme, setting up expectations for players who have only played the previous console entry in the series to be something similar isn't a great idea. Even Mario games have a different naming system, and I would argue those are more similar to each other than Luigi's Mansion 1 and 3. If you had only played Super Mario Sunshine, going to Super Mario Galaxy lets you know while you will be playing as Mario and will most likely be using some similar mechanics, it will be a different experience. If you had gone into Luigi's Mansion 3 only playing the first game, depending on why you liked the first game, you may be disappointed. If I had gone into it with the title of Luigi's Hotel, I would of course recognize that it will be similar to Luigi's Mansion, but when things start to get very different, I would be more understanding. Something I should have touched more on in the first Luigi's Mansion video is how great the atmosphere is. For a kid's game, the light horror mood is felt around every corner. Exploring a haunted house by yourself in the dark with only a flashlight, as a kid that can get to you. I kind of feel sorry for kids playing the third game as their first foray into Luigi's Mansion, as that spooky experience is mostly gone. It's a haunted hotel, but I can't even remember a single area of the game that's even dark. So many of the floors have plenty of light all around, making it laughable that Luigi still has his flashlight. Most floors straight up have lamps on as you explore, the castle area has lit torches all around, the spectral catch area has lit torches all around, and there's even a floor of neon fluorescent lights. I get the flashlight being changed mechanically for the ghost fighting, but not needing the flashlight to navigate through dark areas robs us of that trepidatious exploration that elevated the first title into something great. Even the times where the room lacks a light source, there seems to be a general bright feeling to the area. Even when fighting ghosts, the purple blaze of the gates blocking the doors light up your surroundings. For a game that came out on Halloween day, with its theme of a haunted building, you'd think they would at least try to make it spooky. The ghosts themselves suffer a similar neutering. I'm not here to claim the first title had scary looking ghosts for adults, but for kids I would say they are creepy enough to maybe spook you. In Luigi's Mansion 3, the vast majority of them look like their generic blue versions of Casper. You also have a big red dopey looking cube, a purple one that likes to hug Gooigi, and probably the creepiest one of all, one that uses his tongue to grab you, then spanks you with his other tongue. I think the ghosts being dorky looking is evidence that the developers are trying to steer this series into comedy rather than a marriage between comedy and scary. There's only one spot in the game where I thought something was genuinely creepy, and that was the King Boo painting in the Master Suites, which always turns to look at you. I liked this, but it's a singular moment in a 15 hour game. Basically every ghost cutscene is played for laughs, it's hard to build tension when nothing is taken seriously. What makes it worse is in this game, Luigi is even more terrified than he was in the first one. My guess is next level games leaned into the goofy reactions Luigi can provide because of the leap in technology, and it could be used as a unique selling point for children. I think Luigi's animation is technically very good, a few of his reactions getting a chuckle out of me early on, however, with how often these great animations and reactions occur, there comes a problem. There is now an astronomically large player and character disconnect. I guess I can't speak for anybody else, but at no point in the game did anything keep me in suspense, cause apprehension, frighten, spook, or scare me. It didn't shock, terrify, startle, or even unnerve me. Nothing about this hotel is scary. So why is Luigi so scared? He's already gone through an event like this twice now. The ghosts aren't grotesque looking, and they don't stand a chance against him and the poltergust. Even the jump scares with the spring-loaded drawer send him jumping into the air with fright. Even at the beginning of the game, where there isn't anything scary, suspicious, and everything as bright as can be, he still tiptoes around like he's apprehensive. The only explanation I can think of for all of this is that Luigi has PTSD and a severe case of it. I'm sure an argument could be made that attempting to make the main source of comedy stem from watching a man with PTSD get triggered over and over again isn't a great idea. If I ignore my PTSD theory, it gets a lot more annoying. Seeing Luigi be terrified when he sees ghosts, while moments later I defeat them with literally no problems, creates this constant loop of Luigi proves he shouldn't be scared, Luigi gets scared anyway. It makes me dislike the character I'm supposed to like. I understand his fear in the first game, 
Not only was the atmosphere of the mansion and appearance of the ghosts played for suspense and not just humor, it was Luigi's first go-around with ghosts and a haunted building. He just met a crazy scientist claiming that a vacuum can suck up ghosts. He was thrust into a situation which was foreign to him to save his brother. In contrast, this time, like I said, he's gone through this type of experience twice now. He is scared of average ghosts even though he's defeated hundreds without a problem. And like I said, nothing about this hotel is scary. If anything, the hotel floors more often resemble a theme park than anything haunted. One minute you're in a musical theater, the next you're in a medieval themed castle, eventually you see a movie studio, and of course the neon soaked dance floor. I'm surprised there wasn't a literal theme park floor. The separation between floors is one of the game's worst qualities. Initially you can walk up the stairs from the basement to the first floor, likewise the first floor and second floor are connected. This initially gave me really high hopes for the hotel I would be exploring. Finding routes and shortcuts through different floors and using the elevator as a fast travel if I wanted to go back quickly, that sounded perfect. Well, after floor 2, every single floor is self-contained, left to be explored in one go, then afterwards you leave back the way you came. The elevator ends up being the only way to access the floors. One of the main complaints people had about the second Luigi's Mansion, the one on the 3DS, was that there were multiple mansions that weren't connected together. It seems next level games chose to double down on this while also trying to hide it by putting all of the levels in the same building. So yes, it is literally connected as the hotel is the framing device for the level select screen, but it's just window dressing for completely separate and isolated levels. It might as well have been a literal level select screen instead. Both the first title and third are both equally linear but Luigi's Mansion 1 hides it much better. I think there was a way to make levels disconnected and still work if they approach it like they did in Super Mario 64. I'm not saying Luigi should jump into paintings to enter levels, but at times you had quite a few worlds to pick from. I thought this was going to be how Luigi's Mansion 3 handled it as you get two elevator buttons, floors 1 and 5, right away. Instead, you go through one floor at a time, unlocking one more elevator button every time you finish. There's something so dissatisfying about going linearly through a multi-leveled gimmicked area just to get access to the next level in the game. It feels so artificial. The mansion at least felt like it had some personality, as if it was constructed as a believable building first and foremost, then made it work for gameplay. The hotel feels like it wasn't given much thought, just a tall building where there could be a lot of individual floors. I also have a hunch the level designers split up the workload by delegating floors to certain teams, not thinking to have them communicate on a grander scale to connect any of it. There's just no sense of progression when advancing to a new level. Going from a musical theater-like floor, to a medieval floor, to a garden floor, one after another nearly gave me whiplash. The worst part of this linearity is that none of it was even necessary. The chief benefit of restricting where the player can go is you can slowly ramp up their moveset, items, or challenge. You aren't taught any new moves or given new items that help exploration. The enemy variety doesn't improve much and nearly the only thing that changes is how the ghosts block your flashlight and nothing else. Even when you do need to have a new upgrade to proceed with one of the floors, you're called back by EGAD to do a toad escort mission to receive it. Let's be generous and say you need to have completed the garden floor before the paranormal productions floor for Polter Kitty to work and Spectral Catch needs to see the player complete all of the floors prior, so the time when you get the super suction power up remains the same. We have the musical floor, the medieval floor, the museum floor, the sand tomb floor, boiler works floor, and the magician floor. None of those require any skill or item from any other area. Why do we need to play them in a specific order? Well, I'll tell you why, and it's my segue to the fundamental problem with Luigi's Mansion 3. The main issue is that Luigi's Mansion doesn't understand why exploring a new area can be fun. The first title kind of had this problem as well, but the game was so short it wasn't as big of an issue. If you go hunting for secrets in Luigi's Mansion 3, oh boy, you will find them, but they're all the same thing. Money. Money, 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 gold bars, pearls, coins, cash, money, money. Oh yeah, you can find gems too, except they do nothing unless all of them are collected, and then you get a diamond plunger. Why even bother? Oh, you can also catch boos, but once you collect them all, your reward is that your flashlight can show a boo face when you point it towards a wall. 
Again, nothing for catching booze unless you collect them all. This all or nothing approach is a terrible motivator for anyone besides completionists. Because I know I don't care enough to collect all of them, I now don't want to collect any of them. Contrast this to Breath of the Wild, also a Nintendo game, where you were never meant to find all 900 Korok seeds or 120 shrines. You could if you wanted to, but just finding a handful of them would net you something in return. Back to Luigi's Mansion 3, the only thing that collecting a handful of gems or booze get you is that trademark sense of pride and accomplishment. That leaves us with money. Money in the last game was your score, it determined how big of a mansion Luigi got at the end. A ranking system. I didn't like it much in the first game, and here it's used in a similar way. When playing the first title, any time I got money, I kind of wished that instead there was a shop system of sorts in the game that I could use the money on. Well, I technically got my wish. In this game, they did add a shop system, but it somehow made the money less appealing to me. The only options are a golden bone, which revives you from death, a gadget to find gems, and a gadget to find booze. Yes, collecting money lets you buy tools to help you collect other collectibles. Once I saw this, I viewed collecting money as a complete waste of time. There are so many secrets to find in this game, but all of them are boring since it just shoots out money at you. So removing booze, gems, and money, what is there left to find when exploring? The elevator button. Finding the elevator button should make you feel good. It should be rewarding, like you've accomplished something. Because of the linearity and the fact that the only difference the floor above you will have is a different theme, getting a new button evoked nothing in me. Nothing. I wasn't happy or sad, just... Yep, end of the level. But dork, it's the end of the level! You're that much closer to the top! You know what, dork, you're right. We are on our way! Except you can't even join in with Luigi's triumphant reactions, as the game time and time again takes back the carrot it just gave you. Even though I mentioned earlier that Luigi is trying to find Egad's ghosts, his friend, and the elevator buttons, as if there are three separate discoverable things, your main goal always goes back to the elevator buttons. The elevator buttons are the carrots used to motivate us to keep going. The floors don't need to be explored, we only do it because that's the only way to get the button. When I finally get the dang thing, in my brain, the level is over. That's it, I did it. Let me eat this carrot. Well, hang on a second, the game says. You don't get the carrot just yet. It all starts with the mouse. You defeat the chef, do the ceremonial dance of celebration, but the mouse takes your button from you before you can get your hands on it. You go after it, eventually luring it out with cheese. Fair enough. So now we know that even when we defeat a boss, that doesn't mean we're done. The carrot needs to be in our hand before we are allowed to celebrate. We go through some more floors, and this rings true. We have it in our hands, we get to leave. Eventually we have the garden area, where Luigi finds a button out in the open, grabs it, and instead of bolting for the elevator like I wanted him to, he gets scared by a plant and drops it. Instead of flashing the ghost with his flashlight, he lets him escape. You then go through the floor, eventually defeating the gardener, holding the button in your hand, and taking it back to the elevator. Okay, so now we can't celebrate until the button is physically in the elevator. That's the point of no return, right? That's when we can eat our carrot? Well, if you've played this game, you know where this is going. Skip to the paranormal productions floor. After the boss of the area, you go back, physically put the elevator button into the elevator, and a cat grabs it and runs off, forcing you to chase it for a good 10 minutes before getting the button back. Now nothing is safe, all bets are off, it doesn't matter that you have it, it doesn't matter that you put it in the elevator, the game can choose to take away the one thing that properly rewards the player whenever it wants to. Having to regain something you previously acquired feels like a betrayal of trust, like it's taking away my progress. It's not a good feeling. When that cat decided to fuck off with the carrot I had rightfully earned, I had basically given up on trying to like the game. At this point, I wanted to drudge my way through just to say I did it. Nearly every video game ever made has a developer intended progression path. A lot of games are able to hide invisible walls pretty well and funnel the player into what they intended, while still allowing for some player creativity. 
There are also plenty of games that don't share the same freedom and instead constantly badger you about what to do next and how to properly have fun with the game. Nintendo has plenty of titles that are guilty of this. Well, it seems next level games learn from the best. When designing puzzles specifically, they seem to create them with as little room for alternate solutions as possible. They have a specific outcome in mind and nothing else will work. The word that comes to mind is contrived. That word was the only thing I could think of during this next sequence. I was on the paranormal productions floor for quite a while at this point. This game has so many tools at your disposal to find secrets, I was using my vacuum, dark light, ground pound, gooey and plunger to try to find anything to interact with. Generally, that's how areas in this game work. You interact with things, most of it is just secret areas for gems and money, one of them is the right way to go. There's usually barely even a distinction, one is just the correct thing and one is the extra thing. I made my way to this TV, used my flashlight, and followed the cord all the way back to the entrance. I wasn't sure what had changed since I turned the TV on. I again interacted with everything in this room, nothing. I went back, tried to open the door, it needed the key. Well, the map shows there's a key in the beginning room, there it is, in the wall. I tried the vacuum on it, then realized the plunger is the way to go. Well, I can't reach the plunger to pull the glass casing back. I try everything in my power to get closer, but nothing. I accidentally found out the helicopter has a secret gem, and I continue trying to figure out how to get this key. I keep using the vacuum on everything. I use the dark light on everything. Maybe I need to come from the other side. Plunger doesn't work, the vacuum doesn't, flashlight doesn't, dark light doesn't. Oh wait, the dark light reveals this fire extinguisher. Finally, I got my answer. It darts off into the room I was just in. Maybe this broke the glass casing or I can climb on it to get onto the step. Contrived is all hell, but whatever. Oh wait, no, it just it's just gone. What the heck, there wasn't the answer? It only gave me a few coins? Unbelievable. I go back through the hallway using the dark light on everything here. I try the glass case again. Okay, let's go back to that room once more. Oh, I can press X at the TV. Oh, Luigi needs to go into the TV through the cord to get the key. So there's a couple things wrong with this and one thing that breaks my interest, immersion, and will to go on. First off, why would pressing the X button at the TV make Luigi shove his nose into it? I feel like interacting with an object in a video game shouldn't be a guessing game of what the buttons will do when you press them. Secondly, the right action wasn't to follow the cord back to the other room like it seemed like it was trying to hint at, but instead stay in this room and interact with the TV. Very counterintuitive. Maybe if the cord hadn't had the visual flare, I may have stayed here and found the X button. And the worst part about this, and what seriously led me to write an entire page on this sequence, Luigi. A guy who has been in platforming video games where he can jump twice his height. Luigi, a guy who in this game can use the vacuum to jump his height. Luigi, the guy that apparently can't walk up a single step to get a key and instead resorts to climbing through a TV. Baffling. Absolutely baffling to me how Next Level Games thought this sequence was good enough to put into the game. It could have so easily been changed so that there were barriers around the TV that Luigi couldn't phase through, or even just made the platform higher up. This is one of those things where if you aren't bothered by this sort of thing, complaining about it for as long as I just did seems excessive. I can understand and sympathize, but try to understand my perspective. Nonsensical design choices that make me question whether thinking logically is the right thing to do in their world, this puzzle included, fundamentally alters my perspective on whether I respect the video game or not. Whether it warrants my efforts to care about exploring everything, being invested in story or characters, or even my attempts to care about collecting all of the secret money stashes to get a high ranking. It all goes out the window with a sequence as lackluster as this. A similar but opposite thing happens in the Twisted Sweets floor. There's a table or ledge or whatever that seems like the same height as the ledge in the Paranormal Productions area. So what did the game train me to do in these scenarios? Find a way up somehow. Well, in this room, you can just walk up and grab the key. Just press the X button. Ah, the old X button. A similar thing happened when in the tomb area as well. I've mentioned before that you have so many tools at your disposal, it's a chore having to go through all of them in an area to find the path forward. Well, this area is no exception. It's a gigantic open area that houses many secrets and things to find. The main door forward is closed and you can't open it. 
There are statues on both sides of him. I'll just spoil it for you. You need to press the X button when close enough to the statue on the left. That's it. I even walk up to both and don't see anything, so I figure I need to find something to place on top of the door here, or maybe something to fit into the snake's mouth or something. This sort of thing even happens later on in the Master Suites area. So thinking I need to find a key, I go through this entire desert, combing it like I'm in space balls for about 20 minutes. My girlfriend looked up what I was supposed to do, and we both just laughed at how ridiculous it all was. This is a game where Luigi won't even use his hands to turn a circular door handle, okay? You use your vacuum for that. This is a game where he can't move a trash can out of the way, he needs to ground pound it. A game where he can't push over suitcases, walk over them, or lift them and move them, he needs to shoot a plunger at it so he can smash it. This game, at any chance it gets, makes you use your tools to solve otherwise completely trivial tasks. Why does it resort to you literally pressing the X button when you're close enough to a statue? If this was Uncharted, guess what? I would have figured this out immediately because that game has you solve puzzles by interacting with objects via a contextual button prompt. Uncharted trains me to respond appropriately when seeing these types of puzzles. Luigi's Mansion has been conditioning me time and time again that the vacuum is how Luigi interacts with the world, and yet with both this and the TV incident earlier, the game throws you a curveball by instead hoping you walk up to an object and press X. So like I mentioned earlier, Next Level Games really wants players to go through their game in a very specific way with barely any room for creative expression or player freedom. The linearity is something I mentioned that is bad, but that's not even what this refers to. The boss fights are the clearest way to illustrate this point. For the most part, they're pretty inoffensive, but they all follow the same pattern. They all have something they're holding or wearing that prevents you from flashing them with your flashlight, you need to avoid their attacks long enough for them to get fatigued or otherwise drop their guard, you flash them with your flashlight, and get some damage in. Before I really get into the really bad bosses, I'll say this already isn't a fun way to handle a boss fight. I've said previously in my Cuphead video that maybe boss fights should only consist of you dodging their attacks until they're fatigued, then you hit them once or twice. That style might work when the core mechanics of the game are designed around tightly challenging boss fights with movement systems that give the player plenty of room to react and dodge on a moment's notice. Luigi's Mansion 3 isn't built around that. The core mechanics are better suited for exploration and light combat and puzzle solving. Having to just avoid attacks until the enemy is worn out with no impact on the fight at all until you're allowed to use your flashlight is boring. Especially egregious, as most of the time, the boss's item they're using as a shield is never in a defensive position. It just snaps to the blocking stance when you try to flash them at the wrong time. Even if their back is turned, they will spin around and put up their guard. There's no tactical advantage to being sneaky or trying something cool. Just figure out the singular thing you need to do in the room to get their guard down and do it so the fight can be over. A lot of the time, that thing you need to figure out is baiting out a very specific attack from the boss. It isn't too bad when you need to bait out the swipes from Clem, as that's basically his only attack anyway, and the arena and setting more than mix up for it. The Godzilla fight is a bit more annoying for this, as you need to just wait for the right attack to do anything, only once the charge of fireball attack occurs can you fight back. Where things get more frustrating is with Dr. Potter, Polter Kitty, and Serpsy? I think that's how you say that. Dr. Potter is the first boss to really make me stop caring about the game. Up to this point, I had started to give in to the fact that I wasn't enjoying myself and I wasn't allowed to have my own fun. The previous boss made it clear that there was a very specific way you had to approach boss fights, and if you didn't do it, you weren't going to keep playing. Dr. Potter was on a different level entirely. He suffers from the same problem where even when you clearly sneak up on him and his guard isn't up, your flashlight doesn't do anything. In this fight, you're given a Weed Whacker Buzzsaw extension for your vacuum, and he has a plant that extends. I knew immediately what I was supposed to do. Use the buzzsaw on the plant's stem to chop it off. What I tried was having Guiji be the bait, or draw out an attack where he hits the ground. On both of these, there is an angle where it looks like I should be cutting through the plant, but nope, that's not what the game wants you to do. I again want to point out you have the ground pound, the vacuum, Guiji, flashlight, the dark light, and the plunger. 
you have so many different methods of problem solving that when you're presented with a task with a singular solution, you have to go through all of them trial and error style. I thought for sure Guiji would be used here, as to open the clam at the top of this area moments ago, you needed his dual plunger. Earlier on, to move a giant watermelon, you needed to use Goiji for his dual plunger. Why would they set you up like this with the level design if you're not supposed to take it as a hint going forward? What you're supposed to do is bait a very specific attack from the plant, the one where he juts forward, into the yams or whatever the heck they are so he can be stunned, then you chop off the stem. This doesn't work when he bites the wall, the tree, or Goiji, only this frickin' yam. He also has so many attacks that will shatter the yams instead, like his head swipe and his downward bite. What in this level, besides blind luck and Egad yelling at you, was supposed to hint at the fact that the only way to deal damage to this boss was baiting out an attack that doesn't happen very often in front of one of these yams? This problem could have easily been avoided by giving more than one solution to the puzzle- I mean, boss fight or by designing this whole floor so that you have to bait out attacks from other plants in a similar fashion. How anyone can call this a good boss fight in its current state is beyond me. The only thing I view this as is a waste of time at best. I'm going to come back to Poulter Kitty for last as it connects two of my points together. Next up we'll discuss the Tomb Pharaoh boss. I think her visual design is neat, the way she uses the sand is cool, but she embodies a few issues with the boss structure that irritates me to no end. This is another case of avoid attacks until the boss is vulnerable for your flashlight. This time you suck up her sand face thing, which is awesome. So while you're sucking up the sand, she attacks you of course, the main attacks being a blast radius circle you need to ground pound over, her snakes which bite at you which you just run from, and her charging attack on the ground. This process takes about a minute or so to whittle away her sand face, Afterwards, she has one last attack where her snakes shoot in all directions. Here's where the main problem comes up. Luigi's Mansion 3 does a less than stellar job of telling the player what to do in nearly every scenario in the game. The only way to progress through some areas or find some secrets is to just try everything at your disposal and see what works. That's kind of annoying in a time-wasting fashion with the puzzle solving and exploration, but for combat, it's much more annoying. Like I've said, it takes about a minute of dodging attacks to get to this point where she has the final snake attack. You get one chance to figure out how to avoid damage here. If you figured you had to counter the attack, like you do in a lot of other scenarios, you would need to go through nearly everything at your disposal to figure out how to not get hit. To deflect the attack, you need to ground pound, a tool you've been using to jump over attacks this whole boss fight, and it only works after the snakes shoot at you. I would have figured attacking the snakes would be the right answer, but no. Fair enough though, since you could just stand between the snakes and be fine. I never figured out the obvious, but I don't see why that wouldn't work in theory. However, let's imagine you do mess up trying to avoid it and get hit anyway. What is the first thing you would do in this scenario? Get up and flash her anyway, right? Well, even though she has no shielding or in-game way of telling you she can't be hit with a flashlight, it just doesn't work. Because you took damage, silly. Now do everything you just did again and hope you avoid that snake attack. The flashlight not working even though what's on screen is nearly identical to when you are allowed to flash her when you do avoid the attack is just something I can't look past. It just doesn't make any sense. They could have easily made Luigi take longer to get up so I wouldn't have a chance to flash her. They could have given her a snake afterwards to block the flashlight or just have her vanish before I get her with it. There's a sand fist attack, and to this day, I still don't know what you're supposed to do to avoid it. It comes at you so fast, you don't get any time to react or think about what to do. I tried vacuuming it and running away from it, which of course didn't work, but that's all I really ever had time to do. To top it all off, there was also a time where her snake attack hit me as she was going back into the ground. Lastly, let's talk about Polter Kitty. This boss embodies the absolute worst of the game. I've already gone through why the cat taking the elevator button is bad, but the boss fight itself is one of the biggest wastes of your time. It's hard to believe people at Next Level Games played this and said not only was it good enough, it's good enough for you to do three times in a row. The common theme, again, is baiting attacks and not being allowed to use the flashlight when it otherwise would make sense to. 
Once this boss fight begins, Polter Kitty is perched up high, and he won't come down if you're facing him. I'm not going to go through this one meticulously like it's some grand narrative, I'm just going to speed it up and get to the point. You are forced to wait an incredibly lengthy amount of time doing nothing, waiting for the cat to be in a vulnerable state. Even though using your flashlight on the cat before this specific pose makes all the sense in the world, the game says no, and you need to bait and wait like before. This of course leads to a trial and error scenario, where I literally eventually let the cat hit me just so I could see the full animation to know the last moment before it gets me. It forced me to take damage just so I could see when I can damage it. The reason I say it forced me to is if you try to turn around and flash him at a time that you think would make sense, he fucks off and you need to try it again, this time maybe waiting another second before you strike. If you continue this method of trial and error, it would take you so, so many attempts before you could stun the cat, which is why it's better to just take the damage to know what the rules are. Surprisingly enough, this is the only boss I can remember that has an obvious tell. It dings, and it lights up, telling you when to strike. This is a video game where none of the previous enemies have ever had this indicator signifying they were vulnerable for a flash. There were sound cues for when you already flashed them, but never to tell you they were ready to be flashed. Why would I assume this was the only enemy that would have that and wait until it happens? Even when you do know it happens, you still have to wait an incredibly long time standing doing nothing before you can turn around and fight back. So even at its best, when you know when to strike, it's still a bad fight. Again, this happens three different times. Oh wait, sorry. Um, six different times as the cat takes your elevator button on two separate occasions at different parts of the game. The other half of why Polter Kitty is so annoying is what happens when you're chasing it. This is a problem throughout the entire game, but these sequences take it to the extreme. As these cutscenes happen where the cat takes your button, Luigi doesn't move at all. Even the second time the cat takes the button, he stands there and watches it walk out of the elevator. Really think about this, okay? The elevator buttons have been the thing that Luigi needs to advance to save his friends. There is no way around it, he needs that button. When Luigi sees a ghost steal his button, how is his reaction not to immediately blind the thing with his flashlight? He knows he'll have to get that button back, yet he stands idly by until they're completely out of reach. When you eventually track it down and have a clear shot, the game wrestles control from you so Luigi can watch it escape again. When I found it in the Paranormal Productions rafters, I mashed the flashlight button like I wanted to break my controller, but nothing. Luigi stands there and sulks afterwards. Oh, I feel so bad for you. The game is so set in what it wants to do, even if it means stopping you in your tracks when you get close. They wanted you to chase it through X amount of rooms, and by golly, you're gonna sit there, spamming the flashlight button or not, to watch Luigi do nothing while the cat gets away again. It's ironic that initially in the elevator, Luigi shows no urgency, even though he really should. However, me as a player, I showed immense urgency by wanting to flashlight the cat immediately, even though I really shouldn't. You eventually realize no matter what you do or how fast you go, Luigi will actively stop you before you have any chance of capturing the cat until it's the time ordained by the developer gods themselves. Do you see why this section was called lack of control? It feels like I'm barely a participant in any of this. I'm just along for the ride. Finally, the last topic of discussion, the multiplayer. I kind of can't believe it, but the multiplayer is the most fun I had when playing the game. There's a traditional co-op in the story mode where one person is Gooigi at all times. I didn't do a whole lot in the co-op mode, but the little I did, I enjoyed. It reminds me of Resident Evil 5, where as a standalone action game, it's okay, but as a co-op game, it's great. That's the impression I was getting when in co-op mode. The puzzles that require Gooigi are smoother in co-op than when alone, and the red ghosts feel much better to take down when both can smack him around at once. I'm not sure going through the whole game in co-op is possible, or even if it really is as good as the impression I got, but the fact that it's miles better than how Nintendo implemented co-op in Mario Odyssey, it's a step in the right direction. There's also local multiplayer battle modes for up to 8 players. Capture the most ghosts in the graveyard, fire cannons at targets to get the higher score, 
And finally, the best of all, collect the most coins while on a floaty in the pool. This last one is a romping good time. The time where you're on your floaty in the main game was already one of my favorite sections. That, coupled with the simplicity of trying to bash your girlfriend into bombs is great. It reminds me of bumper cars. In terms of multiplayer, I spent the most time with the scare scraper mode, where you are paired with three other Luigis online to capture all the ghosts, collect enough money, or rescue all the toads on each floor until you get to the top where you work together to take down a boss. This mode makes my complaints about the secrets and the money and even the lack of scary atmosphere and turns it on its head. None of that applies in this mode. Being spooked isn't even on my mind, working together with my team is. Finding secrets is enjoyable, as sometimes it's required to advance, like when you need to find 10,000 gold. That is the goal, so exploring every nook and cranny is rewarding. Even the secrets that don't contribute directly to the success of the main task can still be helpful or even interesting. You can get a siren hat, which alarms you when you're near fake doors, a nice little heads up. You can find a map to give you the layout of the floor, which is helpful as you're timed. You can find x-ray glasses that will point out any time you can use the dark light. You might even lose your poltergust and need to go find it in one of the rooms. The cooperative moments are also extremely welcome and unexpected. Not only is it amusing hearing four Luigi's all celebrate at once, when one of them is trapped behind a door or in a rug, you can come to that Luigi's rescue. Or you can be like this guy, mocking me while I call for help. Maybe it was my fault for opening so many trap doors. I'm not even salty, I laughed my ass off at these moments. I genuinely loved my time with the multiplayer in this game. The boss fight on the top floor is Bulasis, a returning boss from the first game. It's basically the final fight with King Boo in this game, but they've added extra attacks, and the way you suck up the booze works differently than in the first game, which it kind of had to since there's no elemental shots. If you've gotten this far in the video and you haven't played this game before, well, first of all, congratulations viewer, that is impressive. You are a true champion. If you at some point give this game a shot, don't sleep on Scarescraper mode. It's basically the best part of the game as far as I'm concerned. I imagine it would be even more fun with friends. Thank you. Thank you. Ending this video discussing how much I liked the multiplayer seems especially fitting as I think this is what the series should lean towards in the future. As much as I scoffed at the idea of Scarescraper mode when I first bought the game, I realize now that completely abandoning Luigi's Mansion 1 in favor of a more gamey experience that can be replayed like this is what would entice me to come back to the series again. As much as it may not have appeared in my Luigi's Mansion 1 video, I really like that game. But Nintendo wasn't going to fool me again. A main console entry that tones down the disconnected isolated levels in favor of a grander interconnected building, even coming out on Halloween? I was suckered into buying Luigi's Mansion 3, maybe due to nostalgia, but the glasses are off. I now understand Luigi's Mansion 1 is in the past and Next Level Games is in charge now. Thanks a lot for watching everybody. This video was much longer than I thought it was going to be. Uh, at times it was very hard to keep playing because I was very much not enjoying my time with it. I appreciate you watching and subscribe, you know. <laughs> okay, have a good one.